The Triple M's, Shings and I, stand in an open town square, nearby Bahari Ya Kazkazini. Terran security being what it is, Dr. Zimberi wouldn't have been able to collect us from there, so this is the agreed meeting place. I look around at the others, all dressed in a fashion they call smart casual. Aptly named. I can imagine them socialising at a gala or relaxing in their common room in these clothes. Even the Shings have emulated the style. It always makes me wish they were quietly wore clothes. I'm sure that any outfit I attempted to fabricate to match this style would look ridiculous, but the combination of clothes already looking extremely unnatural on my species, and the fact that I'm sure my mind wouldn't be able to reproduce the subtle nuances of it, the way this effortlessly seemed to. I have to settle for having a slightly nicer sash for my welfare devices. For a nanosecond earlier, I considered digging out my old medals to pin onto it, but, well, Messiah has told me that the ones whose house we're visiting is a veteran of the opposite side of the same conflict. It would probably be in poor taste. Plus, all of my medals amount to congratulations for not dying. Not really anything to be proud of. I also believe that displaying medals might not be conductive to the casual part of Smart Casual. Just then, a clear tube with an ornamental conical nose, ornamental swept wings, and a single occupant sweeps near silently over the square before dropping to touch down in front of the group. Nakasiogi Sumberi throws open the access door, smiles, and says, Get in, nerds, we're going to dinner. There was a general chuckle as the group begins advancing with the transport capsule. We fly inside and Dr. Zimberi explains, We'll be able to accelerate to Mach 10 over the Northern Ocean before we have to decelerate to Mach 2 to pass over to the other side of the settlement band. Over the equicultural zone we can start accelerating again, so we'll be able to get up to Mach 16 over the equatorial desert. Should take no more than a few hours to get to the rainforest zone in the southern hemisphere. Messiah puts a hand on his sister's shoulders and asks, You two aren't coming? She shakes her head and says, No, unfortunately, Lul is still busy with home in your Merklets, and Amal wasn't feeling up to it. They both said they'll come next week. He nods, and no more is said about that, as the capsule begins to rise above the buildings surrounding it. It darts forward, and everyone outside the gravity compensation fields of me and the Shing sway from the motion. I experience a motion of fear as I believe there must be a malfunction with the capsule's inertial dampening. Then I realise that Terrans probably wouldn't consider inertial dampers necessary on a planet-side transport. Best to be sure. Doctors and Barry, there are no inertial dampers on this transport, are there? In answer, she passed through her nose and says, No, sweetheart, no inertial dampers. We like to feel the acceleration. Also, call me Kaz, all right? I nod assent as the coastal city disappears behind us. I spot something in the water below. Rather, I spot two somethings. Two very large somethings. One much larger. What are those? I ask the group at large. Messiah answers me. They're whales. I think they're blue whales. That's a mother and calf. Having spent nearly 15 years in close proximity to a Terran, and for much of it having actively studied all things Terran, I've of course previously been aware of whales, but seeing the sheer scale of them is something different. Just as they're disappearing behind us, the mother gives a slight sideways jerk, and my mind fully comprehends that that enormous thing is a conscious aware being, not a submarine structure. Not a semi-sunken ship. That calf has to be as long as this transport, I exclaim. Messiah laughs and nods. I guess so too. I think about 15 of the mother would equal the length of the bright bloom. My mind boggles. Messiah spends the rest of the time we fly over the ocean explaining to me the particular evolutionary history that allowed Berlin Cetaceans to achieve their gargantuan sizes, the struggle that they faced with humans of the past hunting them, many to turn their fat into lamp oil, the necessity to clone certain species back from extinction after the ocean acidification event of their late 21st century, and the fight that Terrans have been undergoing in Parliament to get them recognised as sapient. Obviously our uplifts get full recognition, but really whales are just as intelligent as us already. There's just a bit of prejudice against them because, well, it's difficult to build anything or make any technological breakthroughs when your finest manipulation is a tongue the size of an elephant. They can't really join the community of space-faring species, when they fare the stars, it's in tightly controlled habitats, made by humans. We always get their consent, of course. That mother and child are almost certainly the descendants of blue whales who agreed to be brought here to help with the health of the marine ecology. It's much easier to get permission now that we have translator tech. We had to go through some pretty ludicrous workarounds to understand them before. I smile. My translator informs me that you are mentally capitalizing their species' name the way Terrans do for sapiens. You're clearly sincere. He gives a soft chuckle. Yes, well, a bit of respect is the least I can give them after what my species has put theirs through. Humans have a habit of making a mess. 
Looking out at the coast of the Northern Ocean, coming back into view, I say, Yes, but my experience of your species is that you're also very good at cleaning up your messes. He smiles. A skill you have to learn eventually. We pass at a relative snail's pace over the coastal habitation zone then, accelerating on over the verdant agricultural band. Eventually that gives way to scrub, which, in turn, gives way to scorching desert. Dr. Zanip Kaz raises her voice to say, The capsule is indicating that we're going to pass through a pretty heavy sandstorm. Won't be a problem, but we'll lose visibility for a minute or so. Don't be alarmed. Sure enough, an enormous front of dust looms before us. The ship dives in, limiting visibility to a few metres outside in any direction. I see those who are not benefiting from the gravity fields jerk and sway with the increased turbulence. Roughly 90 seconds pass before visibility clears. That storm had to have been hundreds of kilometres wide at the speed we're travelling. I wonder what they'll do when storms pass into the habitation zones. Well, it's clearly not considered apocalyptic. If it does happen, it certainly would be on any garden world. We enter into a biome I am informed is called Savannah. We see great herds of grazing earth fauna, in quantities I have heard of, but again, not grass before now. The bulk, Kaz tells us, are wildebeest, but she also points out zebra, elephants, giraffes, water buffalo, gazelles, and many more kinds besides. She tells us that these animals provide food for a rich array of carnivores, including lions, hyenas, leopards, cheetahs, painted dogs, and resurrected African saber-tooths. If there are any carnivores down there, I don't see them. The density and height of trees steadily increases until we are flying over a thick canopy, through which the ground is rarely visible. The capsule comes to a halt, in air, and begins its vertical descent. Gesturing out to the thick forest, Kaz says, Welcome to Misu Wavuma. This is my home. We touch down on the landing pad and disembark before the capsule departs, now passengerless. Just as this is on the verge of vanishing over the horizon, Dr. Zumba Kaz rounds me and the Shings. You've all got insect repellents, right? Nu and I both gesture to the devices clipped to our fronts. Nan gives an embarrassed, Um... Kaz rolls her eyes and says, You'll have to stick close to your wife, Furball. The biting insects aren't a problem for us. We eradicated all known insect-borne diseases centuries ago, but I really don't want to add discoverer of Forganesian reaction to mosquito bites to my CV. Understand? Messiah steps in at this point, and bending down to offer his back to the Shing, says, It probably wouldn't be a problem for them. Kaz, the only reason most humans are allergic to mosquito bites is the fact that such a large portion of our ancestors died of malaria. They, having not evolved in a plant that has malaria, would have no reason to have adapted a congenital adverse reaction to them. His sister cocks an eyebrow before saying, I'm sure you don't want your boyfriend to be the guinea pig for that hypothesis, Sissy. Messiah and the Shings all look embarrassed. Victor offers me his shoulder, and Hasako is given a stern lecture from Kaz about how, even though we will be walking on paths and even though the toughest of her underbelly scales is an order of magnitude above anything that might be found in a garden world, uh, she is to be closely on guard for any thorny plant matter that may have fallen on the path. If a thorn works its way under her scales, septic shock may result. She seems sufficiently affrighted by the lecture. The group makes its way from the clearing into the dense jungle. The canopy is so thick that, even with the intense light of the twin Zanzibari suns beaming down overhead, the environment is dim. The forest consists mainly of broadleaf plants with waxy cuticles. As Kaz warned, many of the plants are thick with thorns. The whole biome is a cacophony of animal calls. It's rather unnerving to think that almost every animal I can hear is one that could kill me if I were not under guard by the troop of Terrans. Toon walks next to Victor along the cobbled path through the woods. He takes her lower left hand with his right and they pull close tenderly. It's only slightly awkward for me being on his opposite shoulder. I swivel my head to look behind at Krish, Hazaka, Jenny, Sam and Samus behind us, then back forward to look at the Zunberis, leading the way with the Shings astride beside his back. We walk for some time before a large house, mounted in the canopy, comes into view. Coming to the foot of a flight of stairs, we begin to climb. The fact that all of the Terrans have the stamina to be able to undertake such a climb without even a complaint, after the length they just walked, is remarkable. There was a brief question mark as to whether Hazaka would be able to make the climb, not having feet, but she laughs and relays that, living in a galaxy where foot analogues are nearly ubiquitous, you learn how to climb stairs. We come to the top of the stairway and the canopy top dwelling is unveiled. We are greeted by a group of humans, the bulk of whom look uncannily like Messiah and Kaz. They are mostly adults, but there are six children of varying ages that I infer to be nieces and nephews. There is a cheer as the family members come into view of each other. 
Messiah is swamped by siblings, cousins and children. The Shings are required to hop down to avoid being crushed. The younger children may have no memory of seeing this man outside of a screen. Then, she passed the crowd. Her bearing is such that I do not need to be told who she is. It doesn't require my noticing her copious scars, prosthetic arm, prosthetic leg and prosthetic eye, to mark her as a veteran. There is something in the way she holds herself that conveys that louder than shouting. She may still look like a woman in the prime of her life, but the deference the rest show her marks her as their matriarch. I'm a little envious of the level of respect she has shown. She steps to Messiah and, pausing a moment, she pulls him into a firm embrace. It's good to see you, son, she says, somehow managing to sound heartfelt through her stoicism. He pats her back and says, it's good to see you too, mum. The two pull apart, and the matriarch looks Messiah up and down. You look well. Not too skinny. He smiles. Yes, I've been taking care of myself. Just like you taught me. She gives a satisfied nod before saying, Come, all of you. Dinner is ready. We're so many, we need to eat on the balcony. I assume no one minds that? There is a course of agreement that the balcony is a fine place to eat, and we all file off in, presumably, its direction. As I pass the scarred matriarch, she fixes me with those eyes. One natural and as black as coal, one mechanical and, somehow, even darker. She stares with some intensity, no hostility that I can detect, more like appraisal. Yes, she's giving me the same appraising eyes that her daughter did when I first met her a few days ago, only it feels like comparing a candle and a forge in terms of ferocity. I definitely don't like being so heavily appraised by death orders. Most of a dinner later. I look at the last of the grilled mango half that was provided in accordance with my dietary requirements. It's really too much. This may be a snack to a death order, but its calorie density is straining my capacity to consume it. Stealing myself, I scrape up the last pieces and swallow them down. If nothing else, this will provide for very rich crop milk for Takak. By the time I get back to her, I'm sure it would have been sufficiently broken down and diluted by my secretions that spoiling her with a death world fruit won't be a concern. I look around at the rest of the table. With two dozen Terrans present, it is impossible for even them to carry out a single conversation. Therefore, they have broken themselves up into six or so conversation units. Victor sits to my right. He offers me refill of the juice I've been drinking, and I accept. This feels like a fulfilling moment in life. Just then, I feel a strong hand on the back of the Terran chair I'm nestled into. I turn my head to look into the fierce gaze of the woman whose guest I am. I was wondering if you might care to come for a speed of ride with me, Captain asked the woman, clearly leaving no room for refusal. Victor starts to object, but I throw my wing to stop him. It's all right, Victor. I will be happy to accompany Wing Commander Zumberry on a speeder ride, I say, my voice filled with far more confidence than I feel. She nods approvingly, and I take the remainder of my drink down my gullet and get up on the chair. It's really all right, Victor, I say as I pass him, his face still a visage of concern. The woman leads me to a platform, on which is a shining land speeder. She hops astride it, and after a moment of her knees, I follow, clinging to her back. Once I'm in place, she kicks it into gear, and it suddenly levitates above the forest canopy. She engages its acceleration, and we dart forward at a frightening pace. My compensator keeps me from feeling the worst of it, but she's not sparing the throttle. After a few minutes, the southern ocean comes into view, and she sets us down on the shore. Glad to have a reprieve from the speeder ride, I hop down. I turn to the mother. I'm certain it wasn't just to show me the sights that you invited me on the speeder ride, Wing Commander. She gives a mirthful puff of air through her nose, but her face and body remain placid. You're right, Captain. I wanted to give the measure of you. You are my son's employer, and it sounds like you might be my daughter's employer too soon. Can you blame her mother for being concerned? She crosses her biological and mechanical arms, and fixes me with that same appraising expression she did earlier. A little perplexed, I answer... I'm afraid, ma'am, if I am to be Dr. Nexiorsi Zumberi's employer, I am unaware of that fact. Could it be that she is going to be subcontracted to my vessel via the ODR? The woman smiles and nods. So you are going to attempt to make contact with another death world? I thought so. Why does the ODR even bother with NDAs when Terrans exist? I'm afraid, Wing Commander, that I'm unable to confirm or deny that supposition of yours, I say carefully. She nods. Clearly not needing me to confirm or deny, and seats herself on the bench, her green satin dress becoming somewhat sandy. I walk to the woman, and seat myself beside her. May I ask a question, Wing Commander? I ask, looking out at the ocean vista. She nods. Ask. You've clearly been through at least one round of regeneration. 
Why didn't you allow your missing limbs and I to be regenerated? Why didn't you allow your scars to be healed? She gives another mirthful puff. I could ask you the same thing, she says, gesturing at my bionic leg and eyes. How does she instantly put me on the back foot? Stammering slightly, I say, well, these... I only got these recently. I haven't had the chance to have species appropriate regeneration yet. She nods. And when you get to a place where it is convenient to have that leg and those eyes regenerated, will you? I have to think for a moment. No, I don't think I will, I answer carefully. And why not? asks Wing Commander Zumberi. Again, I'm forced to consider. I suppose there's the improved capability of these eyes and this leg to consider. She queries, and is that all? Thinking further, I answer, no. There's pride, I suppose. She turns that fierce, appraising death order gaze on me. Pride? I stand back and will to face her. Yes, pride. I'm proud of having done what I did. I'm proud that by my action, my boy, your son, our friends, my ship, my life mate, my daughter, and my crew were all safe from death, or a fate worse than death. I'm proud of that. I'm defensive. How has this woman managed to make me defensive so quickly? The Wing Commander nods and says, There's your answer. She gestures with her natural armor, the dark brown, elastomer sheathing of her mechanical one. This is a painful memory for me. The day I lost my arm, my leg, my eye, and my husband. In a war that forced me to leave my children in the care of an AI caretaker. But nonetheless, I'm proud. I'm proud of the part I played in preventing my people's extinction. That's why, whenever I go for a round of regeneration, I ask them to set it such that my eye, limbs, and scars are spared. In a softer tone than before, I ask, Do... do you hate me? She scoffs. What? Because you happen to be the same species as those who took my husband from me? I shake my head. Because I am a woman who fought against your species' survival. I may never have landed a shot on any of my targets, but I definitely tried to. I would have been thrilled to have been a woman who could have claimed she shot down a Terran. She moves her gaze from the horizon and turns it on me, and... Had you managed to score a kill during the war? How do you think you would feel now? Do you think you'd feel proud of that? Instantly I answer, no, of course not. I fought on the wrong side of that war. I fought for cowardice and prejudice. I fought to eradicate a species I thought I understood, but didn't at all. I wasn't fighting Terrans, I was fighting my own imagination. I was fighting against what I thought Terrans were. If I managed to actually kill any of you the way I definitely tried to, I would have been wrapped by guilt about it until my dying day. I'm already wrapped by guilt just for having tried. She gives a light smile, seeming satisfied. Both sides of that war thought they were fighting for survival, Captain. Your side was incorrect. I don't regret you your service, nor would I, if you had been the very Rukwali who had taken my husband from me. I judge you to be a sincere woman, and therefore, I'm happy to give you my blessing as my children's employer. I'm somewhat shocked. Is that it? I ask. You took me more than 200 kilometers from your party to have a three minute conversation? A conversation we could have had inside your house? She raises an eyebrow. You're unsatisfied? I can grow you further if you want. I give an exasperated puff before seating myself in the sand beside the formidable one. I don't think I wish to be grow further, Wing Commander. She smiles. Please, call me Nipernoi. <laughs>